Get closer to your cooking with Neff Slide and Hide. Proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell. I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. Say the word hummus, and it's reasonable to assume nowadays that most people won't get overexcited as it seems to be everywhere. Sometimes, however, the addition of one extra ingredient transforms the dish from being not particularly exciting to very special. And that's certainly the case here where almonds are the transforming agent. When I'm cooking chickpeas, I pretty much always start off with dried chickpeas um, and then I soak them in cold water overnight and they double or sometimes even treble in size and you get this beautiful sort of fat peas like that. So to cook the chickpeas you drain off all of the water they were soaked in, that's really important, and then put them into a saucepan with fresh water and no salt and then just cook them until they are completely tender. So they're just chilling there and we'll come back to those in a few moments. Now, um, with the hummus, I'm going to serve some roasted vegetables. So the roasted vegetables will be determined by the time of the year. And I'm using carrots and beetroot. Okay, so I'm going to cut the beetroot into sort of fairly similar size. Watch out with beetroot, because these are lovely and fresh, but you see they're quite hard. So make sure your knife doesn't go uh, skidding off. And then I'm going to cut these into wedges, like that. Careful. Okay, they're quite robust sized pieces, some carrots, which I just split in half lengthways. If they were smaller, sometimes you can leave the carrots whole and that would be lovely as well. And you'll see here, neither the carrots nor the beetroot have been peeled, so they're unpeeled. So we're getting hopefully extra health and food benefit from the unpeeled vegetables. A little olive oil, as always, extra virgin olive oil. Then some thyme. So I usually pull some of the little leaves off the branches and then I throw in the branches for good luck. Now, a pinch of salt and pepper. Lovely, that's good. So these go into the oven and roast, depending on the size and age of the vegetables, from anything from about 20 minutes to 40 or 50 minutes. Tender, but not overcooked. Now, to make the hummus. My chickpeas are cooled, and what's an important part of this recipe is the chickpea cooking water. So, you, I, so what I like to do is to drain that off, and that will probably go into the hummus. It usually does. Okay, then you can make a hand, the hummus with a hand blender, but I usually prefer to do it in a food processor. And at this point, um, the chickpeas are completely tender, so they just break up between my slightly beetrooty hands like that. So, the rest of the ingredients to add in here. As you'd expect in a hummus, we have the essential sesame seed paste or tahini, which um, is just part of the deep, um, rich flavor of hummus. And it's hard, to, it's just, it's really not hummus without us. So lemon juice is also very important. Now I'm gonna try and avoid the lemon pips going in. You can use a sieve if you want to. Um, and the next thing I want to add in is some garlic. You can crush the garlic if you want to, in the old fashioned way, on a board using a chopping knife. I'm going to use my microplane. And we get it, just puree it in like that. Great. So my remaining ingredients here that I want to add again for authenticity of flavor, I'm going to add in a little bit of cumin. And I've roasted a few little cumin seeds in a dry pan or it could be in the oven just to elevate the flavor to bring out the essential oils and that also um, helps to crisp them up um, and that makes them easier to grind okay such such a lovely thing i always think um, that for me certainly when i'm grinding spices it's a slightly sort of precious moment uh, in the kitchen because of the just the beautiful aroma that comes up um, out of the spices so the other ingredient here uh, which is somewhat unusual, 
are the almonds. So these are almonds that I roasted in the oven about 180 degrees, about 15 or 20 minutes. And that means they get a nicer flavor and a nicer texture. And I'm going to whiz this now just a little bit. Start grinding them like that. Then a little olive oil and some of the very important chickpea cooking water. So at this stage, we've got a creamy consistency like that. I'm perfectly happy with that consistency. I need to taste it to make sure it tastes delicious. And you notice I haven't put in any added salt yet. So it's most definitely going to take salt. Lovely. So we'll pop that into our serving dish. So you can do individual presentations here, or I like to serve this in this particular instance, family style. Lovely, that's good. Now, so my roasted vegetables, tender, but not overcooked. So this is kind of the fun bit. So placing these on, round and about like that. Great. Now, I've got some roasted hazelnuts and some pumpkin seeds and a little paprika oil. To make the paprika oil, I simply add in a little oil in there. Add that about a tablespoon to a teaspoon of paprika. And you get this color, which always reminds me, again, it just reminds me in a way of the colors of the Middle East, like that. Some pumpkin seeds like that, and some toasted hazelnuts. You could chop these coarsely if you want to, but I'm just going to sprinkle them on. And then one final thing, again, perhaps slightly unexpected, but delicious, is a little lemon. Okay, that is pretty much that. So it's sort of super savory, really lovely healthy bowl of food. What's not to like about ham hocks? I wonder are they about to become the new lamb shank as a realization of how good they are seems to have sunk in. We do see them on restaurant menus, but mainly in tureens. Perhaps not as here though, where I simply boil them and serve them with an obvious, but nonetheless delicious mustard and chive cream. Ham hocks definitely could not be described as being a thing of beauty in the conventional sense of the word, but they're really delicious. And the reason they are so good to eat is because they're part of an, the animal, which is hard working. So they've built up more muscle equals flavor. And then to cook them, you simply put them into a large saucepan, cover them with cold water, and then some aromatics. And the aromatics I use to cook are an onion, carrots, celery, some peppercorns, whole garlic cloves, and a bay leaf. And then you poach them for a minimum of two hours, and sometimes big ham hocks like this can take up to three, maybe even four hours. Now, so they need to be cooked until the meat is falling off the bones. See the way they look as if they're sort of ready to come apart there. So I just pick it out of the water a little bit and tease like that. I mean, it's just, is luscious the right word? Describe the way that looks and you know it's going to be juicy and gorgeous. That's it. Cabbage, potatoes, but today, a vegetable with a difference. I'm going to serve a tomato and celery stew with them. And I start off with some celery and onion, and I want to cook the celery and onion slowly just to get it really tender before the rest of the ingredients go in. So cut off the base of the celery like that, and then the celery falls apart. But what I want to do, I'm going to save the lovely celery leaves. So they're lovely. I'm going to use them to garnish this dish at the end. So I'm going to slice my celery. So I'm slicing it at an angle. So I'm going to cook it until it's completely tender. I want sliced onion rather than chopped. The um, sliced onion is more pleasing in this dish rather than the chopped. And the onion sort of almost disappears into it. So cut your onion in half so it sits flat and safely and steadily on your board like that. And then just slice. Like that. Lovely, that's good. Now, great. 
So a um, small sauce, but not too big, because we haven't such volume. Some olive oil, which I'll just allow to heat up a little bit there first. And while that's warming for a moment, a couple of other ingredients. So the fennel seeds I've just roasted and ground, a little bit of crushed garlic, and then a few thyme leaves, just again for a sort of depth of flavor, like this. The oil should be hot enough. Lovely. And then the garlic and the fennel. Sprinkle that in, and the garlic just to add a little bit of depth of flavor. Give all of those a little stir around to coat them in the olive oil. And again, that just pre prevents them from drying out and getting a, a somewhat sort of starchy flavor. You hear it starting to sizzle. Already looks quite nice, actually. And I can smell the fennel kind of saying hello to the celery and to the garlic for that matter. Okay, that's doing very nicely. While that's um, sweating, I can go ahead and make the chive and mustard cream that we're going to serve as the sauce to go to ham hocks and then with our tomato and celery stew. If there's an easier sauce to make, I haven't come across it yet. Cream, which I'm going to whip lightly, and then mustard. And I like to use this um, powdered, old-fashioned powdered mustard here. And I'm going to moisten that. And then I'm going to add this to the whipped cream in a moment with some chopped chives. I find the particular heat you get from this powdered mustard is really, really good. And mustard and bacon, mustard and ham, you know, it's a match made in heaven, that's, that's for sure. Now, when you're whipping the cream, I just want it very gently and softly whipped for this. You see, it's just starting to get little lines. You can see the lines forming from the bottom of the whisk. That's as far as I want to take this. So conventionally, you might even describe that as being slightly under whipped rather than softly whipped, just holding a shape. And then simply add in the mustard. So the heat of the mustard, you can smell it sort of coming up and nearly hitting me uh, in the nose, and then some finely chopped chives. So this is a really simple, lovely thing. To make sure it tastes delicious, a few grains of salt, and a little twist of black pepper. As I say, if there's an easier sauce to serve with ham or bacon, I haven't come across it yet. Very appealing. Okay. Just, yeah, that's perfect consistency like that. We produce our milk off grass in Ireland. Our butter has this creamy golden colour. The taste has always been pure. It's as natural as the day my great-grandfather made the butter. It is so beautiful. Now, let's look back at our celery and onions and see how we're doing. So, looking good. A little bit of steam that we've trapped in the saucepan. That's very important. But they're still crispy and crunchy. So they're not just ready there yet. And this is the key to this recipe, allowing the celery and the onion to tenderize almost completely before the tomatoes go in. So lid back on that, very low heat, trapping our steam in there. We'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. After 10 minutes, the vegetables will have softened and looked like this. At this point, it's time to add the other ingredients, which are tinned plum tomatoes, raisins, and a splash of red wine vinegar. I like to add a pinch of sugar as well. Put the lid back on and simmer for another 10 minutes until the vegetables are all completely tender and it looks like a stew. Right. Oh yeah, this looks great. So the um, celery looks beautifully and tender and the fruit has just sort of plumped up and they'll be sweet and juicy and counteract, you know, the sharpness of the celery and the tomato. So I'm really happy with that. So we're pretty much ready to serve. So I'd like to put everything together on one large dish. Spread out the celery. See all that lovely tomato juice, just fantastic. Now, okay, let's lift our ham hocks out. Just be a little bit careful here, because if you've cooked them enough, they may want to come in several pieces, which is not exactly what you want. So I can use a little bit of spoon to aid me. 
Now, there's a lot of fat here, but don't be alarmed by that because um, you don't have to eat all of that fat. So just prise away bits. And then, oh, look at that, isn't that just absolutely heaven? Lovely, so now let's get number two. There's another lovely little piece there. And then we have our celery leaves. Simple food, rustic food, hearty food. It is all of those for sure, but I think really delicious food. And with the um, chive cream sort of spiced and heated with the mustard, the sweet bacon, the sort of deep flavor of the celery tomato sweetened also by the raisins and the slightly mysterious fennel seeds in the background. Pot of boiled potatoes, delicious eating. The vanilla mousse with espresso jelly that I'm going to cook next is a delicious variation on a classic panna cotta. The entire dessert can be made a day in advance and chilled and will keep happily for a few days, but the sooner you eat it, the more delicious it will be. It does involve the use of gelatine, but as usual, following the recipe closely should ensure a perfect result. So for the vanilla mousse, I have to infuse the cream with the vanilla and also to add a little bit of sugar to sweeten. So simply pour the cream into the saucepan like that. I don't want this to boil. I just want it to come to the shivery stage and add in the sugar. It's not a lot of sugar here, but just to sweeten it lightly. And then I'm using a vanilla pod or a vanilla bean. So I like to give that just a little gentle stir every now and then just all we're really trying to do here is to encourage the sugar to dissolve and to draw some flavor out of that vanilla bean. Now, while that's happening, we can be preparing our gelatin. We can put our gelatin onto sponge. To set this quantity of cream to just a very, very gentle sort of trembling set, um, I need um, two teaspoons of gelatin. I'm using powdered gelatin, two of those. And then I'm going to just, um, Moisten that with a little bit of water, three tablespoons of water. And this is called sponging the gelatin. And the reason it's called that is once you allow this to sit for a moment, the gelatin and the water form a gentle sponge. So we'll just leave that there for, for a second. So just keep a little eye on the cream and the sugar, just giving it the odd stir. The sugar dissolves very easily. And you almost just, what we sometimes describe as the shivery stage, once the cream starts to just shiver from the heat, then, then you've done the job. And quite quickly, that starts to look like a sponge. If I lift it up, see the way it's holding its, holding its position there. I don't stir it too much. I just literally lift up the spoon just to look and see it's at the correct stage. So I'm going to sit this just into a saucepan of barely, not even quite simmering. It could be simmering, but not boiling water. And then I leave it alone. I don't stir it. I might have a look at it, but I don't stir it all that much. And I want all that little sponge to dissolve out into a clear liquid. That's very important, the word clear, because all the little granules of gelatine have to be dissolved to mix in and set the cream properly and accurately. In the meantime here, um, my cream has just come to a shivery stage, so I've turned off the heat. And what I can do now is I can just fish out the vanilla pod. Vanilla pod or vanilla bean, like that. And then I'm just going to cut this in half horizontally doesn't matter if it breaks on you, but it's quite satisfying if sometimes it just decides to behave itself and you can cut it all the way through like that. Then I'm going to take the blunt side of my knife and to get that sort of seed out. So vanilla pod or bean is the long thing and that's the vanilla seed. And that's where the intensity of flavor is and where you get those recognizable little black little flecks of vanilla, which um, look beautiful and add fantastic flavor and I'm going to whisk that in so they're evenly dispersed um, throughout the mousse. Great, that's that. Lovely, that's completely clear, exactly what I want. Now, so I'm going to pour that in here. So just, you don't need to be too slow about this. And if it all fits in the gelatine bowl, I consider that to be quite a bonus. So this is a really, really easy thing to make. 
Just give it a stir, make sure all of the gelatin is in there. Now, you can pour this straight away into your serving bowl. If you do sometimes, however, pour it hot into your serving bowl to get cold and to set, sometimes the vanilla falls, the little vanilla seeds fall. First world problem, it has to be said. Worse things have happened than the vanilla falling to the bottom of your, of your vanilla cream. But to prevent that happening, I'm going to just sit the mousse over ice for a little while. And then I'll just, you don't have to stir it all of the time. Okay, that's pretty good. My cream has um, cooled and is now sort of room temperature like that. So carefully decant it into your serving dish. I'll just give that a wipe so I don't get any watery dribbles. Like that. Lovely. And then that's going to go into our fridge to set. Great. So while the vanilla mousse is in the fridge setting, you can make the little layer of coffee jelly to go on top. So here I've got some coffee, nice strong coffee, and then gelatin again. So this time I have sponged one and a quarter teaspoons of gelatin in one tablespoon of water and dissolved it in exactly the same way as we did a moment or two ago for the vanilla mousse. So that's that, nice and clear, perfect. Now, for the coffee, I want to sweeten it slightly. So I've got some sugar, 50 grams of sugar in my measure here, and I want to bring it up to exactly 200 mils. Like that. Okay, that is really important. I know I've got very little coffee left in the bottom of my saucepan there, only about a teaspoon. But when you're using gelatine, you're using a certain amount of gelatine to set a certain amount of mixture to a particular consistency. In this instance, the consistency is going to be just gently set. So that's now clear. So this is going in here. And that'll be just enough gelatine to give a really lovely soft, soft set. So what I'm going to do with this again, same as the last time, I'm going to sit it over ice just to speed up the process, just to speed up cooling down. Now, don't go off and watch telly or something like that while this is happening, because if you do, it will set completely over ice. Keep an eye on it. I want it to cool until it starts to look sort of slightly syrupy and is cold. Now, the mousse is set and I've been chilling the coffee and if I feel it, the bowl feels cold. That's really, really important. Um, because if it's in any way warm, as you can imagine, it might just melt down a little bit uh, through the cream, which would spoil the effects. This essentially looks a little bit like an upside down pint of stout, completely out of proportion. Just pour that in there like that. And once you get going, you can become a little braver and just dribble it in off the spoon. Okay, lovely. And that now goes to the fridge until the jelly is set. So there we go. Our mousse is set, obviously. Our jelly has set on top. Lovely, shiny, like mahogany glaze on the top, which I love, and the white underneath. And I've just peeled and sliced and lightly sugared some blood oranges to serve with this. Maybe, believe it or not, even a little softly whipped cream. Either way, all of this will work very nicely together. I think that's pretty smart. Get closer to your cooking with Neff's Slide and Hide, proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell.